to the dear rabbi <laughs> that I was the one that asked. My dear wife has been telling me over and over again when she comes back from carnival, loving every minute of it. <laughs> and she says, you know, they ask about you. You know, they, they want you to, to come and they haven't seen you in a long time. And it just so happened that uh, Tom Joyner of the Fantastic Voyage said, Farrakhan, why don't you come on this trip, you know? And I, I hesitated at first, but then I said, boy, it would be a nice thing for me to get away from hell. <laughs> <laughs> and just get on a ship. And I tell you, when I left Chicago and I got away from all of the activity of the Nation of Islam and of course what's going on in America, it was like my blood pressure just began to settle down. And so when I learned that the ship was going to stop in St. Thomas, and I said, maybe I can fulfill what my wife has been telling me and say something to my brothers and sisters on these beautiful islands. I had planned, God willing, to make a, a short tour of the Caribbean sometime this year. I wanted to visit Jamaica, the home of my father, St. Kitts and Nevis, the home of my mother and grandmother, and then the island of Bermuda, which is where my grandmother uh, went and took my mother, and she grew up on the island of Bermuda. So I just wanted to pay my respect, but here we are in St. Thomas, and we're talking about African Heritage Week an African Liberation Day. We all know that there's a long road to real liberation. Having a national anthem is nice, and, and having a flag to salute is nice. And having a seat at the United Nations as a head of state or government as we see in the Caribbean, that's also nice. But it also can be delusional. It also can make you think you are what you are not and you have what you don't have. And we can no longer tolerate delusion. We have to look in the mirror of truth and recognize that we are not yet free. How could you be free in somebody else's name? How could you be free and ignorant of our own culture, our own history, our own language, the slave master took all of that away from us and he wanted to be sure that we would never rise. Can you imagine a man asking you to explain why Farrakhan is here? See, that's a slave master mentality. He sees you not as a senator, he sees you as his property. fight is going to have to take place in order for us to be free and we're going to have to take on power that keeps us in this condition. I thank God for our senator who has the heart and the courage and will not bow down.
order to understand what is required of us, we have to know the time. Because it is time that dictates agenda. If you're a farmer and it's the wrong season, you got the right seed, you're not going to get a good crop. So wise farmers know that they must do the right thing in the right season at the right time to bring about the right results. Then what time is it? I'm not talking about your watch. I'm talking about God's time that he set down that an end to this type of world would come. That's what we're living in now. The end of the world of white supremacy. Now, I, I, I don't need a, you know, I want you to think. I'm not a racist. Never have been. I'm certainly not an anti-Semite. Never have been. But you charge me with all of these evil things because you're afraid of what is in my mouth, what is in my head, and what is in my heart. You don't have a scared to death black man in front of you. And I'll tell you frankly, God hates a coward. And I do too. White supremacy has created in its wake black inferiority. Neither of these are acceptable to God. No man is great because his color is white, and no man is great because his color is black. And if you think that because you are black you are inferior, then how can you be what God created you to be when you have an inferior thought guiding your actions? And how can they be successful in a new world order that is based on equity and justice and truth if I feel that I should be privileged because my skin is white or light. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do to heal from 400 years of slavery and injustice and the doctor and the medicine has been coming, but we're still showing signs of sickness. So again, I am honored to be here. And I would say to the rabbi, with all due respect to you, sir, I have been waiting for years for a dialogue between me and you. <laughs> you didn't hear me. See, I want to bring you out in the public. Since you've been cussing me out in the public and writing ugly things about me in the newspaper, I challenge all of you, meet me before the world and prove that I am what you call me or get up off it. And you know you can't prove it. That's right. So you hide behind the newspaper. Right. You hide behind the television and the radio, making my people think that I'm some ugly man to keep them away from the truth that's in my mouth. Right. Before this year is out, I'm going to challenge my enemies, who are really yours. Prove what you charge me of, and let the world listen. I have no doubt I'll defeat them all, because I'm standing 
on truth and I'm standing with God. That's right. And that's why they have never been able to put a, fr a, 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 a what do you call it? Uh, a frown in my brow. <laughs> I go as I please. I go when I please. And I ask nobody's permission. I'm a free black man. And I want you to be as free as I am. You can't ever be free with your mouth in somebody else's kitchen. Somebody feeding you, somebody clothing you, somebody sheltering you, somebody giving you a job, that's your boss. That's your master. So you got to think twice when you want to be bold. Will I lose my house? Will I lose my job? Oh God, I'll just be quiet. There comes a time in every man and woman's life when you have to make up your mind because the future depends on how strong we are with God and how strong we are on the principles of truth. And that's why Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's not about guns and revolution. It's about truth that will create a revolution in your mind. Paul said it really powerful. He said, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can't renew your mind with the same old ideas that have been fed to you from childhood based on the enemy's educational system. Sorry. Any man that won't treat you right is not going to teach you right. And so in every generation, we pass on the same struggle to our children. Because in our generation, we get to a certain point and we won't go any further. And we'll leave it for the next generation. And now the next generation is very angry and upset. The next generation has very little to hope for. So the next generation has become violent and it's almost that we can't distinguish them as our children. They are angry, so they get guns. They have no job, very little education, so they want to disrupt those who have a job. Those of us who think that our university training is sufficient to make us free. And we become the biggest slave makers because we have a degree that allegedly says we have something that our less fortunate brothers and sisters don't have. And they, like your grandmother, watch you go to college but lose common sense. Grandma, <laughs> grandma didn't go to college, but grandma knew a fool when she saw one. <laughs> and all those famous things grandma would drop on us, you know? <laughs> so I want to start with this. Jesus gave two great commandments. The first one is the greatest of them. 
He said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Stop. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's powerful. Because if we really love the Creator like that, we try to please Him. Because if you love God, you will be obedient to His laws, His statutes, His commandments. He's not a, a, a frivolous God who doesn't know what tomorrow is. God is fresh in every generation. We get old. Nobody older than God, but he speaks to every generation. What is it about the wisdom of God that travels down through the ages that attracts the young in every generation and gives guidance to them? The wisdom of God, the laws of God, when you love him, you want to obey him. When you love him, you're not afraid of anyone outside of him. See, when you can say, I fear God and fear him alone, you're free. You're free. That's a wonderful feeling to have in your breast. Farrakhan, I mean, they hate you. Yes, they do. <laughs> they would try to stop any blessing to come to me, but they don't have a ladder that reaches high enough. <laughs> See, when you fear God and fear him alone, ooh, what a feeling. And when you try to live the life that God enjoins us to live, it automatically produces love. Mm, that's right. Love can't be produced in a lawless society. If your wallet is falling out of your pocket and I see, Let me check. check it out. <laughs> <laughs> and I see something in your wallet that don't belong to me, but I want to, I've learned some pickpocket skills. How can you be my brother and I rob you? How can I be your brother and come in your house and interfere with your family? See, it's living what God has ordered that produces that kind of brotherhood where we feel each other's pain and come to each other's aid. But as long as you are a dope smoker, and I am too, not that I am, but <laughs> you're hustling to fulfill your passion for drugs. And those of us who fear God, we're running to fulfill our passion for liberation of us and liberation of all human beings. There's a big difference. And so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, my teacher, said, we will never love God enough until we are ready to go through what life offers without anger or displeasure with God. There's no life that God has created that doesn't have to struggle. In the Holy Quran, which is the book of scripture of Muslims, it says he created man and woman to face difficulties. But some of us, when we see a difficulty, we want to duck it. We want to go around it. No. Face it. Because when you face the difficulty with God in your heart and on your mind, on the other side of that difficulty is bringing out of you the things that you didn't even know were in you. But if you duck the difficulty... You'll never get acquainted with the greatness of what God has put in each and every one of us. Now, okay. I practice loving God. 
How do you practice that, Farrakhan? They said, well, the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? They shall see God. I just add a little something to that. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God everywhere they look. I don't have to wait to die to meet with God. See, I met you. When I met you, I met him. And if I treat you like he wants me to treat you, then I am one who loves God and know God. And when I see, when I see someone using their gifts, their skills, and their talents, I see God. I don't have to wait to see God to bow. When I meet you, I bow to you. Because each one of you is greater than I am in some respect. There is no man that you're going to meet that is not your superior in some way. So I practice bowing. I'm not bowing to you physically. I'm bowing to the God who created you and the majesty of what he put in you. Does that make sense? I don't care what the color is. God has not left any human being without something of himself. God makes nothing mediocre. Have you ever seen a mediocre fly? A mediocre mosquito? A mediocre bee? If that bee is on his course, you know what to do. You respect it. Now, they can hurt you. Fleas, flies, they're perfect in the way that God created them. See? So when you respect God, you respect his creation. I'm in the Virgin Islands. This is a beautiful paradise for some. I'm going to keep saying that because you are letting it slip out of your hands. Brother Emmanuel 